This is Eileen McMenamin from the Bipartisan Policy Center coming to you from Tulane University. I'm joined by Stan Greenberg, who is one of the nation's leading Democratic pollsters. Thanks for joining me, Stan. Delighted to be here in New Orleans and with the Bipartisan Policy Center. Why, thank you. So um, talk to me a little bit about the changing demographic and what we just saw mm -hmm. last week in this election. Yeah, I think this is, may end up being a pivotal election because it just became so clear the consequence of America being, you know, much more diverse, uh, women playing, you know, different roles, growing roles, um, changing roles, and the two together um, have produced an electorate that Democrats are running very well in, um, and despite the very tough economic times, right. uh, we're able to have a you know big election. But you know, by our measure, what we call the rising American electorate, young people, mm -hmm. African Americans, Latinos, unmarried women, are about half the electorate. Amazingly, and they voted you know about three quarters for you know President Obama. So that's a that's a big factor going into the elections. And how do how do both of the parties actually deal with this changing demographic? Because you've got Republicans who probably need to build their mm -hmm. Hispanic base. Um, you know, Democrats probably could do better with uh, you know white mm -hmm. voters, older white voters, especially. Um, how do both parties go about it? Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, you're right to raise it for, for um, both parties. Most of the discussion has been on the Republicans. Yeah. They got one because they lost, yeah. and because they, you know, didn't get close in the electoral college, and so they just have to come to terms with this, and they've got to do some serious things. And I think you you sense that they need to do that. But if you look at the, you know, the Democratic Party uh, and what their future is, you know, the president ran on. It's the middle class stupid. He ran on the middle class future. He said yesterday that that's the mandate from the election to do well for the middle class. Well, when the dust settles, the middle class is still going to be struggling. Incomes aren't going to be going up. The data came in this past month. Incomes are down. And so you still have a long term problem. We don't have a growing middle class mm -hmm. as a country. And that requires the kind of policies that, you know, also needs a much broader level of support from both parties. The Democrats, you know, did not do that well with white working class um, voters mm -hmm. and white older voters uh, in this uh, election. And um, my worry is that because there's kind of a growing diversity that helps the Democrats, that they don't stop and recognize that th there's a political gain in doing it, but there's also a policy gain. They can't address these problems unless well, they reach out to those voters. Exactly, and is it possible now to be president of the entire country? I mean, we're so evenly divided. It seems like after two years of campaigning and nasty mm -hmm. political ads, you know, it's gonna be challenging for whatever side wins, frankly, to mm -hmm. bridge those divides. Well, who knows, maybe, look, maybe, you know, this is gonna be a turning point on that as well, though I'm sure we've said that <laughs> after other elections <laughs> that this is a, you know, turning point. But we are hitting a fiscal cliff. You know, we are hitting a whole range of problems that have been on hold. You know, kind of, the, in some sense, the two parties have, you know, have kind of positioning for the next election. But I think maybe you can't position anymore. I and mean, these problems are building up. We have to have an energy policy. We have to address climate change. We have to deal with immigration. We have to deal, you know, with our long-term deficits. We need growth and incomes and jobs. And so, you you know, it may be, you know, and there are also a lot of folks outside of politics, ordinary people, you know, organized groups, you know, business, yeah. unions, who look at this and say, look, we, we need an energy policy. Mm -hmm. We need both clean energy and natural gas and other forms of energy. We can be economically strong. And so, healthcare, you know, there's so many groups out there that, on you know, liberal conservative, you know, who now have to make this work. So, there are opportunities. And would you say that the government is more divided than the country or vice versa? Uh, I think the country isn't anywhere near divided as the politicians. Mm -hmm. And they've created a system, you know, with reapportionment and other things, you know, in which, you know, they, you know, one of the main problems is the House, you know, is the House of Representatives, you know, Tea Party dominance, you know, the, you know, so many of these people run in their primaries and they're in very safe seats. Mm -hmm. And that probably the same thing will be true on the Democratic side, um, you know, to some extent. And so it becomes very hard, you know, with that kind of situation. But if you look at the Senate elections, they were kind of interesting. You know, there were, you know, you, you would think it would be a party sweep, you know, but then you'd look at what happened in, you know, uh, North Dakota, you know, in Indiana, and, you know, lots of states in which Obama didn't, you know, do very well, you know, statewide, but nonetheless was elected, you know, you know what would be described as probably moderate uh, Democrats, you know, for Senate. And right. so something happened out there. You know, I, you know, I've been wanting to actually ask that, you know, in this session. You know, one part of the country, you know, you look at, you know, Massachusetts, party drag, you know, clearly polarized and impacted mm -hmm. the Senate race. 
But in the other part of the country, something happened. There's a lot of ticket splitting, you know, and you know, maybe that's an opening. Right, and you mentioned the primary process. Talk a little bit about that and how that's changing American politics today. Well, it is, I mean, look, it's a particular problem, I think, for the Republicans, and I, and I apologize for the, the kind of the one-sided view, but you know, 85% of Republicans self-identify as conservative, mm -hmm. but most Democrats identify as moderate and conservative. And liberal Democrats are a minority of Democrats. And so you have a very diverse, and probably not very united, and you know, maybe even that functional Democratic Party, um, you know, but it's ideologically diverse. So we need to make the Republicans more diverse. That's my goal. But, but, <laughs> but, and one thing that we experience at the Bipartisan Policy mm. Center is that you know, oftentimes politicians are punished for reaching across the aisle mm. instead of rewarded. I mean, in business, making a deal is seen as a positive thing. Right. Um, in and government, the, making the, a deal. And the voters, too. The voters, would, you know, they reward people who get stuff done. Well, so what happens when you're an incumbent who wants to, wants to reach across the aisle and then you get primary? Well, you got to be brave. <laughs> <laughs> we, we need more people who are going to do what's right for the country. I think that's what we got to hope for in the coming months. And in terms of immigration reform, do you see that as something that could get done in the next couple of years? Is that I know um, we've seen, we've heard noises from both mm -hmm. sides of the aisle actually talking about this. Republicans obviously want to expand their base, mm -hmm. um, expand their Hispanic vote. Um, and then President Obama obviously has made certain promises to the yeah. Hispanic community. Do you think that there's an incentive for them to work together, or are Republicans going to try to block this because they don't want to give a victory to the other side? How's that going to work? I think there's an enormous incentive for Republicans to get this done because immigration reform has become kind of a symbolic issue, it's kind of a black white issue. Mm -hmm. The switch turns on, you're either, <clears throat> you know, you have to cross a threshold on whether you're open to this community. Mm -hmm. Immigration reform has become the kind of the measure of that. And, you know, the Democrats, you know, it's the right thing to do, but they don't need it politically. Mm -hmm. uh, Republicans need this off the table. They need, they need to open up. There, they need to appeal to, and there are many, um, you know, immigrant voters and uh, Latinos that would be, you know, open to the Republicans on a range of issues, but can't get there when you have that blockage. And so, I think there's an incentive for that to happen. I think it may happen sooner rather than later because I think the longer you take, uh, the more pressure that builds up uh, within the party, you know, right. against it. Um, you know, there were, you know, he had issues like TARP, for example, that you know took place at a at a crisis, you know, moment. You know, most Republicans, you know, voted against, uh, you know, TARP. It was defeated, you know, once, but it kind of had to happen. Uh, was, and I think in the end, we probably think it was the right thing for the country, but it wasn't, you know, it wasn't popular. Maybe we'll see something <laughs> similar with immigration reform, I think? think? I think that there'll be leaders of the party who are going to say this is the right time. Uh, and you talked a little bit about the Democratic coalition. Is there anyone, uh, you know, one or two names that you would throw <laughs> out there in 2016 who can sort of hold this Democratic coalition that we're seeing? Well, you know, we have a way. I don't know. We have primaries, and without, you know, without it, you know, you know, th th we had a, we had a Hillary Clinton, Barack Obama, very big, engaged primary, with very different bases, you know, coming into play within the party, but we were very unified coming out of the party. There's something, I think, refreshing mm -hmm. about being able to 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 do that. The Republicans have to be able to do this. You know, Bill Clinton waged uh, a primary as a different kind of Democrat, ran against of Jesse Jackson, Harkin, uh, you know, carry on trade. Sure. You know, we were, you know, uh, we were the free trade, you know, candidate for welfare reform, death penalty, um, and won. Mm -hmm. You know, and it was, it was, it was important to changing the, the, the party, and we, we were united in 92. Uh, that, well, let me tell you, we probably lost the 2000 election um, because of Ralph Nader uh, running, and so when you change your party, you know, there's a price. Yeah. You know, we will have probably lost one presidential election, you know, because of it. You know, there needs to be a Republican leader on the, on their side, you know, who, you know, you know, battles in the primary, you know, for, you know, new kinds of uh, ideas to change the party. Um, there may be a short-term price, but a long-term gain. All right. Well, thank you very much, and thanks for your work on behalf of the Bipartisan Policy Center. And I'm happy to do it. It's our favorite client. All right. Thank you very much, Dan. And thank you for watching Bipartisan Debrief.